Mm. So this is the book launch of Incarceration and Generation Volumes 1 and 2, edited by Sylvia Gomes, Maria Joao, Liot de Carvalho, and Vera Duarte. I hope I said that right. This event is being organized by Nottingham Trent University, a critical criminology and social justice research group, and the Interdisciplinary Center of Social Sciences from the Nova School of Social Sciences and Humanities in Portugal and the University of Maya in Portugal. Um, as I said, the session will be recorded. Um, um, so, um, the structure of this session will be as follows. Um, the panel, which I will introduce now, will be presenting each for about 10 minutes, and then we will open for discussion and debate. So I welcome the panel today, which is Josie Taylor, the Senior Commissioner, Commissioning Editor in Criminology of Palgrave Macmillan. Welcome Josie. Michelle Brown, Professor and Associate Head of the Department of Sociology, the University of Tennessee in USA. Welcome, Michelle, and Sylvia Gomes, uh, lecturer in criminology at Nottingham Trent University, and of course, one of the editors, the first editor of um, this book. Um, I'm very excited to hear more, so um, I'll um, leave it now for Josie to start. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for joining, Anna. For allowing me to say a few kind of welcoming words. Um, so yeah, for those who don't know me, I'm the senior commissioning editor for Criminology Books at Palgrave Macmillan, which is part of Spring and Nature, and I'm really pleased to be part of this book launch to celebrate the publication of this important set of books. Um, it's not often enough that we really take the time to celebrate the end point of a research and publication journey, and I think it's really important to do so, particularly when we're spending less time together. So um, yeah, thank you for finding the time to join this, and hopefully there'll be some really interesting uh, discussion and learnings um, and yeah, I really look forward to hearing Michelle's and Sylvia's insights next. So I first met the editors um, or some of the editors six years ago at the European Group Conference in Braga in Portugal and after that Sylvia and Vera published their first edited book with Palgrave, Female Crime and Delinquency in 2018. And I think this book really helped to lay the foundations for the next books as they really explored and expanded on a wide range of themes, including on family, gender, victims, human rights and delinquency trends worldwide. In terms of my own insights as a commissioning editor, my role is really to identify popular as well as growing areas of interest and to fill gaps in the market with books. Imprisonment is an established and popular space, and this is really evident in our leading pris uh, Palgrave Prison st Studies, uh, sorry, Palgrave Studies and Prisons Technology book series, edited by Von Dukes, Ben Crew, and Thomas Ugelbick, which has grown to nearly 50 books, all of them drawing on a really rigorous, high quality and innovative set of research. Incarceration and Generation are the 38th to 39th books published in the series. So it is a crowded market, and so identifying gaps is a little bit harder. But despite this, the editors really did identify and fill an important gap here. They identified a need to explore in one space the wider array of intersections of incarceration and generation from different discipline and geographic perspectives. So I was really pleased when the editors brought this idea to me. The chapter is also really topical, which is normally what I'd look for. So covering really interesting areas like immigration detention, youth confinement and liberty, border policy, and they tie in nicely with the rising interest in building an abolitionist response to the crisis of the carceral state. I also like books which are really in line with Palgrave's style, so typically taking a really critical social justice approach, also interdisciplinary in approach, um, which these books do. Similarly, it's really important for us to kind of centre diverse voices, so make sure we're including voices from the global south. And so overall, there were many reasons why I felt like these books were a great fit for Palgrave. The idea from start to finish came to fruition really quickly, uh, just over a year from proposal to publication, including five to six months in production. So a really quick and impressive turnaround uh, time, particularly to coordinate so many contributors' chapters. Um, there are 19 chapters in total spread across two volumes, which we agreed was really important to cover the varied intersections, um, although I'm sure there are many topics that can still be explored. The goal of this was to really open up the debate for future research and inform public policies. Each volume does have the unique focus, which I'm sure will be talked about a bit more later, um, but volume one focuses on how imprisonment is experienced in different generations, and volume two looks at issues in different contexts and incarceration globally, so both are equally as important. 
But overall, this book has been really successful, I think, in cementing generation as a key concept in incarceration studies. The book has also received some excellent endorsements, um, including one from a researcher at, at Facebook in the US, who I'm just going to quote because I think it really nicely summarises um, why these books are so timely and important. So they said, incarceration impacts not only the individual, but also their families and society. Because incarceration rates are so high, it is vital to understand the impact of incarceration. This book presents a well-rounded perspective on the impact of incarceration on our society, from intergenerational transmission to the impact of criminalising migrants in countries around the world. It's an excellent source for anyone interested in the impact of prisons in several ways, especially from a more international and multidisciplinary perspective. So yeah, again, just wanted to say, it's been a real pleasure working on these books with the editors. I want to thank them, all of the contributors, the endorsers. Um, I hope those of you who haven't read it yet, that you will enjoy it. Um, and yeah, please feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions about the book. Um, you can also find my email online and also really happy to talk about book ideas with Palgrave as well. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Josie, for being with us. I just want to say that the, um, that there is a, a, an access for a 20% discount. Uh, the discount code is put on, um, on the chat. Uh, and also, I wanted to add for any technical issues, we have uh, Marina with us. Thank you so much, Marina, for helping out um, with us. And over to Michelle. Great, thank you all. So it's uh, it's wonderful to be here today to celebrate this. Uh, and I wanted to be sure and, and name a few things uh, about the overall contribution. Uh, but it's also just nice to be in Zoom time with all of you. I think the Zoom call for me here, kind of uh, stranded in Tennessee at the moment, captures the contribution of the volume, which is, again, something that isn't you know, necessarily centered in the same ways and in the same geographies and certainly in the same uh, center of the experiment of mass incarceration in the U.S., but instead is really pushing us to imagine it across time and space in different ways. It's an incredible contribution. So I call it a tour de force in my blurb, and I stand by that today. Um, what I would like to first do, though, is offer congratulations to all of you, uh, and in particular your editors. So Sylvia, Maria, and, and Vera, it's you know, as somebody, as Josie will tell you, I've done a fair share of editing, uh, and the labor of editing is is something that's always both a gift and a burden in the sense that, you know, I've had the, um, you know, the, the privilege of seeing so much scholarship move across, you know, my desk and, and, and my, my mind, my head. Uh, but here, uh, you bring together so many key emergent established voices uh, but in such an internationalist and interdisciplinary way. And you do so not only in original uh, ways and in innovative ways, uh, but you do it in, with a sense of urgency. I was struck like Josie with how fast the project moved actually. Uh, and in a moment with so much political turmoil and a pandemic in which things should have been just the reverse, slowed down. Uh, and all of those things further drive the very urgency of the topic. So it's with gratitude today that I'm here uh, and, and see uh, what you've completed. 19 chapters across two volumes that are not just a resource, but actually uh, reorient you know, a lot of what we do in the literature and in the research around punishment and society uh, for both researchers, scholars, and students. Uh, and I think you move us importantly toward a distinctive field of study. Uh, but if that's not enough, and if the geography is not enough, the, the various levels and dimensions, you know, that are various moments named, uh, in the volume, I think deserve uh, reiteration here, which is you're moving across a variety of administrative levels, of juridical levels. I think, uh, in fact, that as much as the emphasis in this volume is on punishment, it's also a real contribution to law and society uh, in terms of the work it does around the legal uh, and legal focal points. Methodologically, I find it to be uh, unusually rigorous and, and unusually even in its rigor for edited collections. And I, and I say that as somebody who's you know made those uneven collections myself. <laughs> so it, it is, I think, a space in which it really comes through the empirical as well as the theoretical. Uh, what I'm probably going to speak most about, though, is actually the conceptual work, and I think that conceptual work comes through particularly in two introductory chapters that the editors assemble for both volumes 
which are unusually careful and attentive in their work, uh, I would argue, uh, and then how that work is unpacked by uh, well-disciplined contributors, I think, who, who very much were concerned with furthering that. Uh, so to all of you who are on the call as authors and, and contributors, uh, with different social, geographic, and cultural contexts. This is truly a comparative volume, but one that truly has, in my mind, uh, a two-volume set that really has a core uh, that continues throughout. And, and I, I don't think that's always what we're able to accomplish as much as we try to. So uh, it's also, and I think this is something, you know, that I would argue is um, a bit more difficult to say, uh, given where I am in my career, I'm someone who wakes up every day both equally pessimistic and optimistic in our current moment. So just kind of a roller coaster of both. Uh, but having done punishment in society now for, for a couple of decades and, and through its peak moments in the US, um, I'm also once again kind of um, blown away with the way in which this works as a testament uh, to once again kind of the global planetary configurations of the carceral that we, we live in and the, and the immediate shifts that we're witnessing as well as some of the historical ones. The volume, because it does focus on generation and generations, moves us into a space where we can see that more clearly. Uh, and I, I think that's an incredible, powerful way for us to orient ourselves toward things that might be an otherwise, right, and all of this. So for those of us who are thinking about everything from reform and abolition to revolution, there's, there's very key things here for us to be aware of. Um, I don't want to go without saying how important this is as another model, and we have many, and I'm, I'm really, again, uh, given where I am in my career, so pleased to see these things taking shape. This is truly international, truly global research that moves us beyond the vectors of just the North and the South, as well as the West and the rest, uh, and moves us into discussions through a serious recentering of things that help us see kind of the holistic aspects here of what we're talking about. And it does so, and once again, you know, the way, the manner I think that is most important to our work interdisciplinary. Uh, so we're not simply confined within our disciplines either, we're moving across the work that you've all brought to this. Um, so in terms of its conceptual contributions, I, I think it forces us to rethink both generation as a construct, which we've done far too little with in criminology and beyond, uh, and imprisonment. And I think it's actually increasingly challenging to expand the landscape of how we understand perhaps imprisonment, even though we're doing it, um, but it does do both. For me, of course, thinking about generation was incredibly useful uh, and the way it's thought of as something that is occurring within a plurality of possible meetings as opposed to a narrowing, which is often what we feel forced to do when we're putting together something like this. Uh, and to give us limits in terms of how to think about generations. Rather, you know, our, our editors and our authors are very good at pointing to things like kinship, descent, like life stages, like cohorts, uh, and beyond, but also saying there's much more to this, right, that's happening, that generations uh, are experienced in the moment, in the, the historical period in which they're occurring very differently across groups uh, and across various levels of structural and interpersonal experiences. Uh, and I found that both urgent, necessary, and needed, particularly in you know, some of my own work that I'm thinking through well. So orienting us toward horizontal as opposed to kind of the, the ways, particularly in sociology, that we're used to thinking about vertical dimensions of research across class and gender. Uh, but thinking about what it is. For instance, one of the categories that I really followed throughout uh, across various pieces in the volume uh, and thought was helpful in reorienting a lot of work that we're doing is childhood uh, and the emphasis on childhood and thinking about it in particularly as a space where when we link it to punishment, we have to think about children as social actors who's in, in which the very category of their experience and and the experience of childhood is essential in relationship to liberty uh, and not deprivation, um, imprisonment and detention, even as those were the very things that, that folks were mapping. I was thinking in particular about a time very early on in my research where I was doing work in Philadelphia in uh, one of the early penitentiaries in the US, but it was at, at that current moment a jail. 
Uh, but it was designed architecturally in a way like uh, the early penitentiary so that when adults entered the cell, uh, the, the doors were very low so that they had to bend and literally bow and be penitent as they moved in. The problem was in the tiers that I was in, it was young children, all of whom were black and brown, who were running around just playing in and out of those cells. They did not have to do that because they were too short. Uh, and I remember kind of the horror of watching children playing in a prison uh, and, and what it was like to think about both architecturally uh, as well as conceptually across time, um, the suffering of children in these kinds of spaces, which is ongoing. So lots of ways for us to think about that. It comes through particularly clearly around the conceptualizations of, of migrant children uh, in detention as the first response and the administrative response increasingly in the EU as well as here. You know, I was struck when Goldson, Goldson and Randazzo write, in sum, the global practices of child and youth imprisonment impose profoundly detrimental impacts on some of the world's most distressed, damaged, and disadvantaged children. That's not necessarily a new narrative. We've always been mapping that in punishment society, but it's strikingly, uh, increasingly harsh uh, and intensified as these pieces make evident. Uh, so one of the things that I continue to think about throughout this was also the relationship our authors are, we can't think about generations at all without also thinking about uh, the centrality of confinement and imprisonment and incarceration to the landscapes in which we exist. So we're also forced to take on this broader definition of incarceration and its role function effects as usual across uh, transnational state institutional and the intimacies of everyday life here. Um, I, I was just mapping throughout the volume and part of what I learned and was reminded of, the prison population globally, right, continues to expand 20% higher than it was 20 years ago. In that time, uh, we now hold 50% more women uh, in custody and in prison than we did, with the percentage of older prisoners continuing to rise. And of course, children being de detained at increasingly younger ages and for longer periods of time. And this doesn't even expand fully out into say things like, you know, right now I'm working on a project right here in Knoxville uh, with school push out and disciplinary measures and how many children are being mandatorily pushed out administratively and by law. Uh, into other kinds of configurations of confinement. Uh, prison still remains overused, sentences are getting longer, um, resources are always limited, prison conditions continue to worsen, all despite the thing we've been mapping, regardless of the pandemic jump we're seeing in the US, a decrease in crime that's been fairly consistent, uh, and the ways in which instead other populations are moving in, particularly around immigration, uh, migration, uh, marginalization, vulnerability, and oppression continuing to be the vectors. So the penal landscape broadens. Uh, as it does this, so too does its generations. And I think that's one of the things I carry away is that there are generational pulls through vectors of confinement and incarceration that we've been remiss in theorizing and, and giving close attention to. Uh, among the most disturbing is this, quote, generational transition uh, that many of you are writing about, particularly in the European penal field, that's blending administratively, of course, immigration and cr criminalization uh, and confinement. And that, of course, is a carceral trend that I think we're witnessing in a lot of places. And how we normalize steadily incarceration as a social destination, but also as an age destination, as a period destination, uh, and an intensification uh, throughout all of that. So it's an incredible, not just edited collection, uh, but a primer in many ways, I think, on this sorts of thing. It, it reorients us toward family, as it should, and the structures of family. It reorients us toward intergenerational transmission, as Josie was saying, and structural variables. Keep me on time, because I can go on all day about these things, folks, so let me know if I'm taking up too much time. Um, it shows us, too, how different periods of confinement are forged through generations and generations are forged through uh, periods of confinement. Uh, it also leaves us with, I think, incredible questions. Uh, I think that the, the future work that we're directed to uh, across both volumes is also work that they're still doing. I was struck, uh, you know, by the emphasis on really developing a focus on what it is to to take care of the elderly and get, engage in caregiving as well as custody uh, and to start thinking about, you know, as I think 
a lot of folks are doing radical care and what radical care looks like within, without, beyond these kinds of um, carceral spaces as older people move into various forms of confinement. Uh, and I was struck how that merged with the pandemic in the discussion because certainly I think we're, we're right to be uh, wary and aware of the fact that uh, the elderly have been positioned in this in ways uh, both within homes, within administration, uh, within assisted living, within caregiving uh, and social services in confinement through the pandemic. Uh, so lots of ways to reconceptualize all of that, as well as surplus of disposable populations. There was also a really important emphasis on technology and digitalization, which I think, you know, we, we have difficulty conceiving of current generations from Gen Z and Zoomers uh, in terms of how radically they've been transfigured by their access to, to media and technological landscapes and how that's reshaping generations. Uh, TikTok literally changes, I think, generations almost overnight in terms of fads and fashions and other things. Uh, it's certainly doing that as well in other ways. Uh, the rise of e-carceration in connection with all of this. Uh, and then again, you know, other ways we can think about this uh, is the ways in which we have ongoing forms of deprivation, deprivation and confinement to be very attentive to. Uh, the only other comment that I would make in terms of all of this and encouragement I would make is that for all the work that's happening, I think within confinement and imprisonment, and, and as authors uh, and editors point to as well around this piece, we can we also know that it is precisely this intensification of penal landscapes and trajectories and their influence on generations that's moved us much closer towards struggle, uh, much closer toward uh, something like a counter movement to the carceral and to the thrusts of the carceral and all of this and to demands for justice that are otherwise. Um, and for me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm both anxious and excited about those prospects uh, and do believe that we can, you know, there's something to be said here for the way and something maybe to do, you know, there's like a third volume out there uh, that looks at generational struggle. Uh, and the way in which that too is reshaping justice across and within generations in very different ways with very real points of contestation, uh, both consensus building and absolute disagreement in terms of how we move forward around all of this, but, but such an incredible moment. And that too is going to have to be global, multi-coalitional. It should look like Zooms like this and, and build from places. Uh, that, that are moving across time and space uh, for all of us. So I'm, I'm very eager to see that moment take shape. Uh, and I think you've done a lot of work to contrib contribute to that. So congratulations to all of you uh, for an amazing amount of work in such a tough time. And, you know, I think I would conclude with saying that I really hope that I get to actually have face-to-face -face time and in-person time with all of you. I have high hopes for those of you who might be in Lisbon in July uh, and with Law and Society, where I hope to be as well. So um, congratulations to all, and I'll turn it back over to, to everyone else. Thanks. Thank you so much, Professor Michelle. Um, and we're all looking forward to hear more about the, about the book. Very interested. To hear more about it from Sylvia Gomes. So I'm going to give it over to Sylvia and um, she will also be introducing the authors, um, the amazing authors that we have from the book in this uh, meeting as well. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Hind. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, I can see that we have people here from different countries and with different time zones, so that's that's very good. Um, a, a special thank you to Michelle Brown and Josie Taylor for taking the time to present this book and for for your kind words. Uh, it's really good to, to hear you. Um, and thank you to all the authors that are joining us today as well. I see you. <laughs> I can see Ana Valestros uh, Pina, Pedro Souza. Jose uh, um, Brandaris Garcia, I can see Ana Guerreiro, Rafaela Granja, uh, Cristina Fernandes, uh, Raquel uh, Oliveira. Um, am I missing anyone? <laughs> um, Antonella. Yes, Maria uh, Imaculada Fincias and Antonella Tirafi. Thank you so much for being here today. I believe that I'm not going to put you in a bad position if I say that if you have any questions for the authors as well, please uh, go ahead and um, bring your questions either in the chat or, um, you know, just 
just ask any questions. I think they will be happy to answer. Sorry for that. Uh, I do not want to take much of your time, uh, but but I'm taking this opportunity to say some words about how the idea of this book started, uh, what the book is all about, and what it is covered in each volume. And finally, um, some, well, thank some important people without whom these two volumes would not be possible at all. So over the years, uh, Maria, João, Vera and I have developed research on trajectories to crime and delinquency of children, youth and adults in the justice system. However, each one of us uh, was researching these groups separately. So Maria Joao researches mainly on children and youth, uh, Veda on youth, particularly on female delinquency, and I research mostly adult prisoners. Um, we have been working under the same research center for more than a decade now. Um, at the Inter Interdisciplinary Center of Social Sciences in Portugal. And we would have conversations about the possible bridges uh, that our work could have. Uh, some of our findings would be transversal to all our work, regardless of the age group that we were doing our research on, but others seem to be more specific to the age group each one of us was covering. Um, but how could we discuss our research in a more integrated manner? So how can we dialogue uh, our research? Being aware that the age group and the generational moment lived by individuals would play a significant role in understanding crime, delinquency, and obviously their incarcerated experiences, we decided to initiate and expand our debate to other geographies and to other areas of knowledge. And that's how this book <laughs> was created. So the way to embody this debate was in the first moment uh, via this publication. This book is born with the purpose to understand the links between incarceration and generation. And its main goal is to present the, complex, the complexity and all, all this complexity and all the complex nature of the multiple intersections between incarceration and generation through a variety of chapters that cover different geographies, um, different uh, judicial systems, and different administrative contexts of incarceration, as well as different areas of research in law, social sciences, and many other areas. So we expanded, instead of focusing only on incarceration from a more formal, traditional way of looking at it, we expand the concept of incarceration in light of the renewed complexity of social issues in relation to the measures involving deprivation of liberty worldwide. Uh, and so we include forms of the so-called traditional course of institutional confinement, such as prisons, jails, and juvenile detention centers, and add other forms of administrative and institutional imprisonment, such as um, immigration detention centers and re or reception centers. We also expand on the definition of a generation, uh, including different conceptual conceptualizations as a principle of kinship descendant, uh, descent, sorry, uh, as an age cohort, as a life stage, or as a historic period. It is, our it is our understanding that this book, two volumes, fills a gap in the literature, um, as there is no international book that aggregates, reflects, compares, the, fund, uh, the founding co concept of incarceration covering different generations and the multiple dimensions and experiences of intergenerational and, inter and of intergenerational relations, while at the same time setting the ground for an eventual uh, new line of research in crime studies field. We acknowledge obviously that we already have uh, studies that cover intergenerational um, um, discussions, and this is not new, but the way we can start building from here on into, and integrating new ways of conceptualizing incarceration and generations within different geographies and um, judicial context, we can actually build something new. And so thanks to the, su the suggestion of Josie Taylor and the prison uh, series editors, we organized the book in two volumes. It was supposed to be only one. <laughs> but Josie suggested that it would be two and we ended up doing two volumes. So the first volume entitled Incarceration and Generation, Multiple Faces of Confinement 
explore diverse experiences, dynamics, uh, cultures, interventions, and impacts of incarceration in various generations, from childhood, youth, and emerging out adult, emerging adult, adulthood to adulthood and older age. This, this volume is structured in a way that makes it possible to follow the individuals through their life stages, um, starting with chapters on childhood and ending with chapters on the elderly in confinement. The first chapter written by Cristina um, Fernandez Bessa and jo jo Jose Angel Brandaris debates the expansion of the penal landscape, exploring the multif uh, multifaceted, multifaceted nexus linking prison and immigration detention centers across European juris jurisdictions. The following chapters focus on the incarceration of children and youth. And here we have the chapter of Barry Goltz and, and Silvia Rendazzo, which provides us with an update on the rationale for fostering the debate on the abolition of measures involving um, the provision of liberty regarding children. We also have uh, the chapter from Maria Immaculada Ruiz Fincias, uh, focus, uh, which focuses on the incarceration of an, accom an accompanied, sorry, an accompanied, I might not mean to say this word correctly, but well, children that are not accompanied by anyone. <laughs> um, there are minors uh, in Spain who are targeted by both uh, state control efforts and welfare schemes. Then Kurti um, Zeilmans and colleagues, as well as Maria Juan Liot Carvalho and colleagues, presents their work focus on the transition from youth to adulthood. So Kurti uh, and her colleagues uh, explore the incarceration of youth, uh, of young adults in European justice systems, highlighting the complexity and intersection of factors that serve as grants for judicial measures aimed at emerging generational category of young uh, adulthood. And Maria Joan Liot Carvalho and colleagues identify profiles of young adults placed in Portuguese prisons, exposing the major contradiction between law and practice in this particular group. And they help to enhance policy making and gear it towards more effective practice and different pre prevention strategies. The following chapters are about incarceration of adults. Here we have uh, an, a great contribution from our Brazilian colleagues, Fernando Sala, Marcos Alvarez and other colleagues, which uh, present an overview of this history of adult imprisonment in, in Brazil, highlighting the main social process that have driven the rapid rise um, in incarceration rates in the country. And a chapter signed by myself and Dixie Rocker, which discusses uh, gender differences in the way adult prisoners perceive the impact of incarceration on their re-entry process and on their expectations after release. We also have the chapter from Anna Belisarospina, which explores the Canadian immigration detention system concerning the situation of young adults and adult undocumented migrants. Finally, drawing on the reality of the elderly in prison, Claire de Mott presents an in-depth portrait of the UK's penitentiary system, highlighting the realities we are regarding elderly prisoners. So taken together, the chapters in this volume provide a greater understanding of the intersections of incarceration and generation, particularly the importance of considering various forms of incarceration and the differences and similarities between the various incarcerated generations. The second volume, um, which is entitled Incarceration and Generation, Challenging Generational Relations, presents and debates key intergenerational relation issues within incarceration. We wanted to include more debate into the intra-generational um, issues, but to be honest, it was more difficult to find people that would be working on this particular area. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, the, that there's not out there. <laughs> um, it was, not, colleagues were not able to, um, to provide their insights for this particular volume. Um, so chapters in this volume focus particularly on intergenerational continuities in imprisonment, intergenerational justice and citizenship, the impact of incarceration on multiple generations and within families, and also the media representations of the intergenerationality of incarceration. So the first contribution to this volume draws on data from the prime longitudinal study, the Cambridge study of uh, interlinked de uh, development, 
Catherine Otte and her colleagues present a unique analysis of the prevalence of instances of imprisonment in two generations of the study to establish whether there is an association between the imprisonment of a father and that of his son. The need to adopt a holistic view of child participation across the entire justice system provides the basis for a chapter by Cedric Fossard and um, Hai Ryang Yang. They adopt an original approach uh, that goes beyond the concept and problems of detention, better alternative options and reintegration measures, arguing that children should be seen as part of a larger system when it comes to systemic participation and impact across all the stage, stages of the judicial and other legal proceedings. So they should be heard and not just adults talking about children and deciding about children. Anna Staranuf and Antonella Tiravasi make a relevant contribution that sheds lights on a major problem in Latin America, the vertical violence within prisons. The authors bring to, uh, bring to the discussion the victimization perpetrated by police officers and prison staff in relation to the young and adult population behind bars, pointing out the need for a more in-depth reflection on the social and legal construction of the concept of youth and young adulthood in contemporary societies and inquiring about the nature of the judicial responses applied to them. The two following chapters offer valuable complementary views on parental issues regarding fathering and mothering from uh, within prison and its constraints. In the context of a Portuguese male prison, Rafaela, Rafaela Granja advances the knowledge um, on how imprisoned men manage their fatherhood and reflects upon the intergenerational impact of their imprisonment. Ellen Nemando uh, Linonj Fontevo addresses the effects of incarceration on female prisoners and their children, adopting a gender sensitive approach and using standpoint feminist theory to give a voice to women's perspectives in the Cameroon penitentiary system. Continuing the discussion of intergenerational relations through the lens of the family, Anna Guerreiro and colleagues reflect on the intergenerational family ties among organized crime groups contributing to a better understanding of the overall international intergenerational impacts of family ties on incarceration outcomes, while simultaneously drawing attention to the intergenerational transmission and impact of delinquent behavior in organized crime. Bringing to the discussion the media narratives on the emerging problem of the incarceration experiences of migrant families in the United States-Mexico uh, border, Jack Mills and colleagues discuss how the media portray dif the different generations of migrants being held in immigration detention centers. Many of the themes and concerns running through this, uh, this volume are actually reflected in the final chapter, written by Manu Dibula and colleagues. So the authors argue that the intergener intergenerational effects uh, of incarceration need to be further researched and that more rigorous and compelling research needs to be, to be further researched um, needs to be used to improve our understanding of the phenomenon. Most of the policy discussion has focused on direct negative effects on the incarcerated individuals themselves. But individuals do not live in a vacuum, obviously, and any effects of prison reforms could cascade to others in their network of contacts, acquaintances and family members. In particular, as the research suggests, um, children are strongly impacted by having a parent serving time in prison or in an immigration detention center, center. and so we should be more um, aware of this and, uh, and be more um, keen to, to look into these realities. So our ambition is that in time, these two book series will encourage academics to reflect on the relevance of considering this domain as a distinct field of research, aggregating all the significant work that is already being developed by scholars across um, disciplinary boundaries and promoting additional uh, studies on the links between incarceration and generation. However, we are very much aware that many other conceptual, analytical, methodological, and even theoretical debates uh, need to be incorporated and expanded beyond what was covered in these two volumes. The present series is simply a small seed, uh, and we would like to leave for the reader to reflect on, uh, hoping it will eventually grow from there. Finally, and I'm almost finishing, let me tell you that writing a book in the middle of the pandemic has been an incredible challenge. <laughs> we are forever grateful 
to all the authors that accepted the challenge to contribute uh, with their time and expertise for this book. We would like to thank Paul Griff, Paul Griff Macmillan, for the support provided in making this book possible, particularly to Josie Taylor, Adam Kumar, and the Reminder editorial team. Thank you to the reviewers over the book proposal and to the reviewers of each one of the chapters. Um, we highly appreciate the double role uh, performed by some of the authors that acted as reviewers as well of their colleagues' work. Um, thank you to Adriana Bechairouz and Franz Saftel for their crucial role in the process of language editing and proofreading the entire book. Uh, a big, big thank you to all the endorsers, including Michelle Brown, <laughs> who was one of the endorsers um, of, these both, of both volumes, uh, which reinforced our belief that this is really an important piece of work. A special word of appreciation to all other authors who started with us on this journal journey and regrettably due to the circumstances related with the pandemic were forced to abandon this project. Um, and a final thank you to my partners in crime, Maria João and Vera, for being the backbone of so many academic and non-academic adventures. You rock, I love you, and we are completely insane. But I really enjoy working with you. Thank you so much. And that would be it. I don't know if in fall asleep <laughs> with my presentation. No, I'm trying to unmute. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, and thank you for uh, introducing everybody and introducing all the chapters uh, really nicely. Um, and, uh, and now we're open for questions, discussions, debates. Um, if any of the authors want to um, want to uh, say a comment or say something as well, please come forward. Good afternoon, everybody. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm Cedric, uh, Cedric Foussard. I've got a very, I've got a very bad internet connection today, unfortunately. So I'm not sure I will put the camera on. If not, you can hear me. I just wanted to to thank the um, the group for um, having organizing such an interesting uh, compendium of articles. I know how difficult it is to. Um, to deal with a difference of style, different of level of English, and different uh, level of um, culture sometimes, etc. So uh, I know it was a, it was a, a challenge, and um, and the, the the final result is excellent. So I would like to to thank you all for um, uh, having organized and inviting us with my colleague Michael uh, to produce this article. So that was the first time that we produced an article on the on the systemic approach on child participation which is, let's say, more than uh, listening to the voice of the child, but uh, focusing on the child-centered justice system uh, where um, children are, and, and young people are actually a part of the system and, um, and where the, the different uh, elements um, of the system are focusing on their um, uh, rights well-being and uh, in terms of justice what we are all looking for it's better reintegration so uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity of uh, producing this article and um, and we wait for the next uh, next edition thank you thank you very much Cedric um, anyone else have any question comment Remember that the special issue discount as well, um, special offer discount is on the chat. So you can copy and paste that code and use it. And the link is there and it's valid until January, February the 7th, sorry. So from January the 10th until uh, February the 7th.
none of the authors want to say anything about their chapters? Uh, hi, hi everyone. I just want to, to thank uh, Josie and Michelle and all the authors, uh, including Cedric. Uh, it's been a long way working with Cedric and that it, it has been a pleasure working with you all. And um, thank you for all the support. And uh, once again, thank you also to Sylvia because uh, we are a small team, but uh, very, very tough on working. And I think also I would like also to, to, to stress that perhaps this is one of the first collaborations between these three entities, academic entities. And this is the first product, but we hope to have other products and other materials. And as Michelle told before, perhaps this is uh, this team and these issues, there are so many things emerging with the pandemic also and uh, with um, all the social context that we are living worldwide, that we, we have to think and re rethink the, the chapters and uh, to promote other initiatives to discuss it, hopefully presentially in Lisbon with a law and society meeting. That will be a great opportunity, perhaps. But we hope to see you all in brief time and keep working with you all. Thank you for everything. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, and so I'd like uh, to remind everybody that um, this, this introduction um, uh, and, uh, and the talks that we had today will be um, shared on our social media and our, on our new YouTube channels uh, and hopefully shared with all of you. I think Marina Pejera would be, would be responsible for sharing it with, um, with the attendees today. Yes, uh, if, we, if you want, I believe we have the um, emails of the, the people who are attending today. So if you want, we can uh, send them directly the links to them, yes. Yeah, I think that would be um, that would be great. Um, and um, please go ahead and buy the book. And uh, looking forward to see you soon uh, in our upcoming events. Um, thank you again for um, uh, for the the research uh, center for um, the interdisciplinary center of social science from the Nova. School of Social Sciences and Humanities in Portugal and the University of Maya Portugal and of course Nottingham Trent University and the Critical Criminology and Research um, and uh, Social Justice Research Group for organizing um, this and of course thank you Josie and thank you so much Michelle, Professor Michelle Brown for being with us today. Any final comments be before we bring that to an end? It's, um, yeah, I just want to say thank you again. And it's amazing when you kind of think about how many people are involved in potentially just one or two books, you know, to see all the contributors or many of the contributors here is really special. So thank you all so much for your contributions. And um, yeah, hopefully more books to follow at some point in the future. And yeah, thanks again for, for organising this. It's really nice to connect with everyone and see people's faces again. So thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. I think I put everyone to sleep. <laughs> well thank you so much for being here i really appreciate your presence and and especially you know for the authors and the panel and all of that so thank you so much for listening and we we really hope that you read the books and you provide some feedback we'd love to have your feedback on um on the publications thank you All right. Thank you, everyone. And goodbye. See you in the next event.